friends, and welcome to Good Questions, No Easy Answers. Uh, in this uh, installment, we're going to talk about religion and science. Um, you know, I was kind of a science nerd growing up and uh, majored in chemistry and physics when I was in school. I love that stuff. And in preparing for this, it occurred to me, uh, one of my very favorite authors is this guy named Richard Dawkins. Uh, I've read uh, seven or eight of his books, and I, I really enjoy them so much. And what's interesting about Dawkins is he's an atheist, and he's not that doesn't happen to be an atheist. Is his mission to try to make you an atheist too? And I think, why in the world do I love this guy's books? I mean, I love bouncing off that perspective, which is interesting. But he talks about so many things that it's just intriguing. The wonders of the universe, your genetic makeup, how that came to be. He talks about the echolocation of bats, the explosive squirts of bombardier beetles, so many things. And I find myself just intrigued. I'm not offended by who he is or what his project is. I'm not... Uh, mortified by that. Christians need not be nervous uh, around science. Genesis 1. Uh, you know, people say, how does that square with science? I mean, Genesis 1 was written centuries, many centuries before there was such a thing as science. It, it's not a it's not a science textbook. It, it's more, I, I asked uh, David Wilkinson this question. Uh, David uh, was in the United Kingdom. He's amazing. He is an astrophysicist and an ordained Methodist pastor, right? And uh, I did a podcast with him that was fascinating. I want you to hear a little bit of what he has to say here about Genesis. I think if you read the text carefully of Genesis 1, for example, there are clear indications that this is not a science book, but it's a song or a hymn. It's a mm. uh, um, a song which celebrates the greatness of God. So, James, if you ever on your podcast in, uh, interviewed the writer of Genesis and you said, how old is the universe? I suspect the writer of Genesis might say, to be honest, I'm not really interested in that. What I'm interested in huh. is that you understand just how great this creator God is. And let's join together in singing a hymn of worship, of praise to, to God. Now, the fact that it's a hymn or a song doesn't mean that it's not true. It's just it has to be interpreted in a different way. So for me, the origin of the universe, which we have currently in terms of the Big Bang, and then Stephen Hawking's view that maybe by involving quantum theory and other universes is a good explanation of the very first moments of the universe, I'm quite relaxed about because... Um, that's, in a sense, to be held alongside the fact that Genesis is saying that the whole foundation for quantum theory, for the laws of physics itself, which science can't explain, by the way, the whole foundation of the laws of physics is God. Uh, I like that a lot. God is the foundation of physics uh, itself. You know, theology... Religion can declare God created the world. To me, science can show us how God created the world. Although Stephen Hawking, I told you this in the first episode, is there a God? Stephen Hawking wrote a book called The Theory of Everything, where he says you can explain everything that is without recourse to some higher power, without a creator. I don't think God minds that. I think God even sort of likes that. You don't have to believe in God. God doesn't want to compel us to believe. It's a choice. It is about love, uh, after all. Uh, God made the world, God made me, we say in the church. How did God do this? I, I love the, the preacher from the late 1800s, early 1900s, named James Weldon Johnson. He wrote a great poem about the creation, and, and the way it ends up is like this. God's created all these other things. God sat down on the side of a hill where he could think. By a deep, wide river, he sat down with his head in his hands. God thought and thought till he thought, I'll make me a man. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay. By the bank of the river, he kneeled him down. There the great God Almighty who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hand. This great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay till he shaped it in his own image. Then he blew into it the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Amen. <laughs> I mean, I love that. 
Uh, but it's a metaphor. I mean, how did God create the world? How did God create me? There's a great moment in uh, March of 1953, uh, Crick and Watson. Uh, Francis Crick uh, stood up in the Eagle Pub and announced, gentlemen, today we, had, we have discovered the secret of life. They, they had discovered DNA that day in 1953. We had discovered the secret of life. I, I mean, I, that's right, and yet it's kind of incomplete. Like, I'm, I'm made of DNA, that's the secret of who I am, but, but there's more than that. You know, DNA has never explained things like our transcendent impulses. Like, where's that in your DNA? Our DNA can never explain things like the nobility of sacrifice. Uh, science, uh, evolution, DNA, these are all wonders and, and great true things, but they can never explain things like the nobility of sacrifice. It's all about the survival of the fittest, right? Uh, uh, many people think that now our spirituality can even be traced to something biological in your brain. Should we be troubled by that? I, I don't think so. I think if God wanted us to be spiritual, God well could locate a spot in the brain where that would happen. Uh, one of my favorite questions is, is science a friend or an enemy to religion? I ask this also of David Wilkinson, the astrophysicist who's uh, ordained. So I'm in high school and then early in college, uh, I was getting interested in religion and at least the people that I was around, they were nervous about science, right? Yes. Like, yes. is science the friend or the enemy of religion? Mm -hmm. Then it was kind of an enemy. It was sort of a peril. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, how would you answer that? Is science the friend or the enemy of Christian faith? I think for me, it's, it's always been a, a friend, but sometimes a questioning friend. So a friend who asks sometimes difficult questions of me, uh, of my faith, many of which I still don't have the answer to, James. Hmm. But in that conversation with science as a friend, uh, it's always led to a deeper excitement with my faith and a deeper excitement with science. I love the way he puts it. Uh, science poses even more questions back to uh, faith. I love that. He told me that... Um, he was doing Q&A one time, and, and somebody said, what if Jesus got near a black hole? Well, you know, that's a fascinating question. I mean, I wonder things like, you know, are Adam and Eve real, given what we know about uh, evolution and genetics, or are they just symbols of an emerging humanity? I've raised with some people, and they get nervous, but why? Right? There's, science is good. There are other science things that come up in the realm of faith. You know, we, we live in a world where there are political debates that are hot right now about science. People have yard signs saying science is real, like science is up for grab. I always think when it comes to uh, science and what's going on in the world, it, it's best for us not to posture politically maybe to listen, maybe to be humble. Maybe we always default as Christians to caring for the earth, uh, not to save it. Or I think about St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, you know, he was amazing. He wanted to protect God's earth. He'd never heard of global warming. He didn't know anything about environmental crises. He wanted to protect God's earth because it, it was God's. <laughs> God made it. He didn't want to step on a creature but because that, that was one more creature that God had made. It was part of the chorus of praise of God just by being. Maybe we default to that. Like, what out there damages God's world? It's not a political thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a place within our faith where we care about uh, what God has made. If we think about uh, science and religion, the author also run into all kinds of ethical quandaries. Sometimes science runs faster than human wisdom. You know, wisdom takes time. You, know, you ponder something, you, you see how it turns out, you learn, you ponder, the wisest people reflect. But, but now science goes so fast, you almost can't catch up. If you think about something like infertility technology seems like a great thing like oh i can help us have children but then you have like the leftover eggs and there are all kinds of quandaries we don't yet have the wisdom so as people of faith we want to try to grow toward that wisdom and not just gallop too rapidly maybe toward every scientific advance is that a faith? We wait for wisdom, and wisdom takes time. Now, speaking of time, um, I asked you guys, what are questions that you have 
uh, about faith. And one question that quite a few people asked is, why did it take God so long to send Jesus? Like billions of years are passing, you got the dinosaurs and everything. Why did God take so long? Uh, I posed that question to my astrophysicist friend, uh, David Wilkinson. Why did God wait so long mm -hmm. to do what God did? In See, I've, we were just in uh, Montana yeah. and Wyoming where there are all kinds of fossil finds yes. and yeah. millions and millions of yeah. years passing. And then God finally, finally, humanity and then Jesus. Yeah. And here we are. I, I couldn't find an answer. I, I did dig wow. up. I mean, it's a very I did good dig question. Up some notes that I found from I heard John Polkinghorne yes. give a lecture here yes. a few years back. And he said he said this: the many billion year history will discourage any thought of a God who works by magic. God's not in a hurry. God is patient. God has allowed the world to make itself. There is unlikely any other way in which love would choose to work. That's the best I could come up with. I, I think that's I super. So and and I think that's a very good answer. And it, it reminds us that actually that God isn't the immediate manufacturer. God is the divine artist. And sometimes if you talk to artists, um, they can do pictures in about 30 seconds on the back of an envelope. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes it takes years to get to that stage of producing the masterpiece. I mean, I've got a I've got a really trivial illustration of this, which it doesn't hit the heights of my great friend and mentor John Polkinghorne, but I often put it like this to to, to people: um, When it's my birthday, my wife bakes me a cake. It takes considerable time. The kitchen is in considerable mess afterwards. Um, when it's her birthday. I go to the local supermarket and I buy a cake for her. <laughs> now, which expresses the most love uh, in terms of the action? And uh, I have to admit to my wife that the time taken and the mess involved in order to produce something is far more telling of love than the husband who wanders down to the supermarket and chooses a mass produced cake. Now, I think I'm trying to say exactly the same as you've said um, in rather more trivial ways. But I think that sense of investment, investment of time, investment of patience, investment of complexity is about a God who um, not only wants to bring about humanity, but also simply loves creating, simply loves the extravagance of creation. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm an astronomer, and they, they ask me often a similar question, which is, why did God create so many billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars? Hmm. Uh, and part of the answer to that, I think, for me, is that God just loves to create. <laughs> he loves the diversity. He's an extravagant God. Um, and I don't think everything is focused on bringing about human beings. I think we are part of that rich tapestry that God is creating. Um, I like the way he puts that. God just enjoys creating. <laughs> God enjoys creating. Science helps us enjoy what God enjoys creating. Uh, it blows our mind. I used to say the best preaching on TV, this is when you used, used to have a lot of televangelists on as you'd surf through the channels. I couldn't stand the preaching that I would see on TV. So I would say the best preaching on TV, it was always a show like Nova or Cosmos. Like they're showing us all these wonders out in space and little tiny things and what's under the sea. It's just extolling the glory of God. We now have uh, the James Webb Telescope and it's sending us images far into space beyond anything that we could ever imagine. I don't know what our reaction to that is supposed to be. I just find myself in awe. Just, what, even if you weren't a religious person, you could be in awe of this, right? It's something that we share with people who don't believe in God. It's something we share with people of other religions. I think that's something to celebrate. We're just in awe that that telescope is looking so deep into space and there's a little pinprick of light. That actually is a whole galaxy. It just, God wants us to drop our jaw, to 
be lost in wonder, love, and praise. Uh, I'd commend to you thinking about science, religion, and the world, Annie Dillard, another of my favorite authors. Uh, she wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book called Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. And in this book, she just went outside and noticed stuff and then wrote about it. And uh, I love in, in the emails that I send biweekly, here, here's a quote that I put in there that just bears repeating. Annie Dillard says, look at the horsehair worm, a yard long and thin as a thread, whipping through the duck pond. Look at a turtle under the ice, breathing through its pumping cloaca. Look at the fruit of the Osage orange tree, big as a grapefruit, green, convoluted as any human brain. Look in short at practically anything, the coot's feet, the mantis's face, a banana, the human ear. And see that not only did the creator create everything, but he is apt to create anything. He'll stop at nothing. There's no one standing over evolution with a blue pencil to say, mm, nope, not that one. That's ridiculous. I won't have it. God is profligate, Annie Dillard says. After watching a mock mockingbird swooping downward, she compares his free fall to, quote, the old philosophical conundrum about the tree that falls in the forest. The answer must be, I think, that beauty and grace are performed whether or not we will sense them or not. The least we can do is try to be there. I cannot cause light. The most I can do is try to put myself in the path of its beam. <laughs> I think science helps us really. We can't cause light. We can't cause these galaxies. We can't cause that pumping cloaca. I, I can't cause me, right? Uh, but I can put myself in its path. I can put myself in its beam. I can be lost in wonder, love, and praise. I hope you uh, can love and enjoy science like I and so many people do. It, it, it's such, a, I think, great friend. Uh, to face. Stay tuned uh, to good questions. We'll continue to take up various uh, items and explore them. They don't really have easy answers, uh, but it's fun to talk about. Thanks for being with us.